The Chargers are back, and there's plenty of excitement in the air about this team. Whether you want to go to a game at SoFi Stadium or you want to go to a road game when Justin Herbert comes to your city in America, ticketing is very important, and it's really important how you get your tickets because there's plenty of sites out there that want to scam you and put all these charges and service fees that you didn't originally agree to. But that all changes with TickPick, the exclusive ticketing partner of the Guilty as Charged podcast and the Blue Wire Network. That's T-I-C-K-P-I-C-K. They're the original no-fee ticketing site, and they are able to guarantee the best prices on all of their NFL tickets. If you don't believe it and you can find better prices, TickPick will also give you 110% of the difference on the same purchasing price. The Cowboys are coming up. There's plenty of high-profile Chargers home games coming up, road games all over the place where they travel to Baltimore and go to Kansas City. So you can go get tickets at TickPick.com charged and use that promo code charged to save $10 on your first order of Chargers tickets. I know you want to see Derwin James. I know you want to see Brandon Staley. I know you want to see all those boys and get that Chargers W. So go to TickPick.com slash Charged and use promo code Charged for $10 off your first ticketing order. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Chargers Analytics with Arjun. And wow, you know, we we got past week one with the W, 1-0 to start the year. I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think I could have been any happier um, with the way we played. And obviously, you know, there's room for improvement all across the board, but I don't think the box score is indicative of how well the offense played how good they looked the play calling and then the defense man like it it wasn't as much you know as I honestly expected um especially from like the interior defensive line group but we'll, we'll get more into that uh later in the video but you know great start one and oh and like I said before it only shows we won by four um but I think some of the advanced stats and metrics shows that we should have had um a bigger a bigger game in terms of points um I think the number one reason why, you know, we only won by four was we sucked in the red zone. And um, it, I'm not sure if I really want to put that all on like Justin Herbert or, you know, the offensive line, or if it's a Joe Lombardi thing, Uh, there's no blame to be put on one singular person or unit. Um, It's just that they weren't able to convert uh, in the red zone. So when you have three drives, that total, like 190 something yards, right? They had the 10 play, uh 75 yard drive that the 18 play 60 something yard drive and both of those ended in field goals and then to start the to start the third quarter or the second drive in the third quarter they had another double digit play drive for 60 yards where uh, i think that was the herbert fumble call which is which is horrible by the way like um you know i'm not going to go over that we've seen enough of that discourse especially on twitter but when you have 190 yards of total offense and only come away with six points in three drives, that's not a great recipe for success. But I'm here to tell you that the red zone offense is something that is sort of lucky from year to year, from week to week. And they were going against one of the best front sevens and probably in my opinion, the best front four uh, in the NFL, maybe outside of the Steelers. So for them to you know, not perform as well in the red zone um, is um, something that we shouldn't be too concerned about because the Redskins are a very good defense. But like I said, an amazing performance. Let's let's dive into the stats um, that I have. I have a lot of stuff that we're going to be going through. Like I said, this is the regular season now. This is it's time for me to step up. It's time for me to show you guys all the advanced metrics, and we ha- finally have a bunch of data to look at. So number one, let's look at how Justin Herbert performed. So. We know he threw for you know over 330 yards, only one touchdown. Uh, he threw an interception, had a fumble, um, and you know the Chargers per PFF's charting uh, had five drops. I know there were a couple of things going around about seven. There were five balls that were catchable that were dropped. Um, so obviously that hurts Herbert's EPA a little bit. 
And remember EPA stands for expected points added. And that is one of the ways that I'm going to be evaluating quarterbacks over the course of the season. So like I said before, Justin Herbert had a really good day in my opinion. Like I thought he looked amazing, especially first time in this new offense. Now, as I say that he shows up, you know, kind of middle of the pack when it comes to EPA per play. Um, so if we go and we just look at, okay, I need to update this again, but when we just look at EPA per play, um, Herbert shows up 16th. Now a 0 0.2 EPA per play is nothing to be like, damn, he sucks. A 0 0.2 EPA per play is pretty solid for, for a quarterback. And like, if you look at some of these top quarterbacks, like when uh, Jameis, Teddy Stafford, and you know, all these guys, you know, it is week one only. And, um, you know, these numbers will come back down. So Herbert performing at this number isn't a bad thing. But let me show you guys something that I thought was super interesting. And I will uh, explain why this happened later. Okay, so this is, so, you know, the two turnovers that happened, uh, the fumble in the red zone and the interception in the red zone, right? Those two plays lost Herbert around 10 expected points added. So, you know, EPA is a, on a per play basis. So those two plays, Herbert averaged around, you know, negative five EPA. So what I did is I went into the play-by-play -play data and I took those uh, exact plays out. And so Herbert's EPA jumped from 0 0.2 to 0 0.397, which is pretty much around 0 0.4, right? So remember that Herbert ranks 16th overall when considering his two turnovers, but turnovers are sort of lucky the fumble was BS. We can all agree on that. And the interception was kind of just a miscommunication, sort of a bad throw by Herbert. But so remember, 16th in EPA with the turnovers and around a 0 0.2. So now let's go back to the, to the other tab. And so if we use that 0 0.397, Herbert had the seventh best day in the league per EPA without the turnovers. Now, of course, we have to use the turnovers in some form because it is part of the analysis. But like I said, the fumble should not have been called. And the fact that Herbert had the seventh best day per EPA per play without the turnovers against a defense that was projected to be a top five defense in the league is amazing. That is, it's amazing. And, you know, I work at PFF, so I'm not going to, you know, talk bad on them and I have nothing to talk bad on them anyway, but, you know, I, I will admit that PFF uh, was at the forefront of you know, predicting some Herbert regression and it was fair. I've mentioned this in multiple videos. He's going to get worse under pressure and he was not good under pressure, but he wasn't under pressure that much last uh, yesterday, or I'm recording on Monday. So I'm going to say yesterday as in Sunday. So he wasn't good under pressure, but he wasn't under pressure as much. Remember, the Chargers overhauled this offensive line for one reason and one reason only to prevent Justin Herbert from being under pressure more often. And they did. And Rashawn Slater, what a freaking day that guy had. Zero pressures allowed against probably the best defensive line in the league. I mean, Chase Young, Montez Sweat, absolutely shut down. You watch the tape. Go on Twitter. If you guys haven't gone on Twitter, just search up Rashawn Slater in the search tab. Jeff Schwartz tweeting about him. Brandon Thorne, uh, Colin Cowherd, Daniel Jeremiah. This, these big media experts all recognize the type of day that he had. So amazing job by him. The rest of the offense line played pretty well. Storm Norton, you know, outside of the sack fumble that happened, he had a pretty solid day. Abushi was good. Lindsley and Filer were iffy, but Filer had a pretty good day in the run game per PFF grading. So Herbert, a pretty good day per EPF per play. Remember when we factor out the um, the turnovers? Well, you should always always use the turnovers in, in looking at the games, but you know the the fumble was not a good call. The next the next thing I was super happy about was the early down pass calls. Remember the Chargers that first drive that they had was just perfectly executed. It was just marching down the field, early down pass, first down pass, first down pass, first down play action to a pass. I mean, the, the way that Joe Lombardi called this game, I think me, Tyler, and Steven were talking about it. They were, they called a really, really good game. Like the, the play calling, the, the throws that Herbert was able to make because 
of the of the calls that uh, Lombardi was giving him. It was it was very very impressive to see. And so when we use a five percent to ninety five percent win probability, so this is pretty much excluding that final drive where Washington was kind of out of it. The Chargers had the ninth highest. I'm gonna go to the table setting. The Chargers had the ninth highest pass rate on early downs. Now. This was super interesting, and this was something I saw um, on Twitter and on, on Discord a lot, right? The Chargers had, you know, a really, or especially Justin Herbert. I'm going to go back to uh, this, this um, website, uh, this tab, actually. So if we only, sorry, if we only look at first and second downs, which are the early downs, right? You know, you'd be surprised that, or you might or might not be surprised that Justin Herbert was actually the worst quarterback per EPA per play on early downs. Now, just keep this in mind. He was the worst. And we go to this graph, you know, the Chargers had one of the worst dropback EPA. So EPA per pass on early downs. But like I said, I'm here to, to show you guys that this really isn't true. Because like I said, when I factored out the turnovers, which one of them was bad and one of them was just, you know, he kind of led him too far. So it wasn't the greatest throw, but it also wasn't like an egregious mistake. Herbert's EPA was 0.04. So not the greatest, right? Like obviously you want your EPA to be above at least like 0.1, 0.2, but 0.04 is definitely better than a negative EPA, right? So now we go, if we go back to, to, to the other tab and we look at, okay, where does 0.04 rank? It, he jumps up to pretty much, um, he, he pretty much jumps up to, to 17th or 18th, which again, it's not the greatest, but it's not horrible either, right? And the Chargers were going up against a really good defense. And so the fact that Herbert was still performing at somewhat of a good level, a high level is good to see. And now this is the thing that really interested me. And this was something that every PFF, or not every PFF, some PFF guys, some other analytics guys were like, this is one area where Herbert's going to regress, but he didn't. And this was super interesting to me. So on third downs alone, Herbert was one of the, if not the best quarterback on third downs. He had a 1.13 EPA per play on third downs alone. And I think, I forget who it was. It was on someone on Twitter. They were, oh, it was Robert Mays and Nate Tice, two guys, highly respected um, athlete. They do the athletic football show. They were talking about how good Herbert looked on third downs. Like, look at where he is on the graph, top right, exactly where you want it to be. It, he had the most plays on third down. And that's honestly something where you look at how that happens. And th that's because they're playing a really good football, like really good defense. That Washington defense, I'm pretty sure every single starter on defense for them were was their projected starter going into the season. So they didn't suffer any, like, big time injuries on defense. So the Chargers were going up against one of the best defenses and they were healthy. So the fact that Herbert was in the most third down situations of any quarterback in the league isn't that surprising, but the fact that he was also the best, one of the best quarterbacks on third downs is, is beautiful. And I'm going to go to this. Um, I looked it up earlier. I'm going to show you guys. So this tweet by Mitch Mitchell Schwartz, who, you know, a highly respected um, guy on, on Twitter and in the league. Um, so he said his theory on how the NFL sees quarterbacks, your quarterback needs to consistently be able to get you yards on third and six. And I thought this was super interesting when he posted this. And this was the, my immediate thought when I saw this and how good Herbert was. Okay. So what that Herbert was so like really good on third downs. And yeah, it's probably unsustainable throughout the course of a season, but you know Herbert's going to get you a bucket. You know Herbert's going to drop, like, you have faith in him to drop a dime on third down. That third and 16 call where he found Keenan on that, on like a, on the trips curl route. I mean, the, the confidence you have to have as a quarterback to make that throw, the confidence you have to have as an offensive coordinator to put the ball in your quarterback's hands on third and 16 inside the 10 and call that route you have to have the utmost confidence. And that's what Lombardi showed. He trusts Herbert. He trusts what Herbert's going to do. And I mean, that was just a beautiful game by Herbert um, that, that I was able to see. All right. 
So I believe, yeah. So again, this is how they looked on early downs. Again, this number is probably right near the middle or right near the mean. Um, and obviously if we factor out the, uh, filter out the turnovers, uh, the, the stats look more in the Chargers' favor. So that was um, some, of the, some, of, some of the stuff about Herbert. He looked amazing. Uh, here's the offensive line breakdown for the Chargers and how they looked. You know, right about at the mean, when it comes to pass blocking grades for PFF, Rashawn Slater, amazing game. Like I said, zero pressures. He had the second highest overall PFF grade uh, behind only Pene Sewell, who, again, I'm, I'm super happy he had a great game at left tackle versus Nick Bosa. He did allow a couple pressures, but his run blocking grade was pretty high, and so I was happy to see that. So her, uh, the Chargers did really well uh, when it came to run blocking, especially on that offensive line. Matt Filer looked amazing at left guard. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, with, you know, when, when they don't have to play one of, uh, I'm, I don't know why that happened when they don't have to play one of the best defensive lines in the league, you know, their, uh, team offensive line grades will probably be a little bit higher. Um, just cause I'm going to be talking about the Cowboys eventually Cowboys run blocking grade wasn't the best against the, against the Buccaneers, but you know, the Buccaneers have, Again, one of the best front sevens in the league. So blocking them in itself is pretty tough. But they were really good or pretty solid when it came to pass blocking grades. But as I'll show you later in my cow, uh, semi-Cowboys preview, um, Dak Prescott did get the ball out very quick. And the next, last thing I, I kind of want to talk about for the Chargers that you know is super important. Um, I'm, okay, I'm, I don't know if you can, you're going to be able to see this uh, behind... It, it might be behind my camera uh, and I'm not, I can't really move that, but the chargers uh, per this graph had the highest defensive pre-snap open middle of the field rate of any team in week one. Um, I'm pretty sure the Raiders and the Ravens won't be higher than the chargers. And this, I'm making this before the game, before the Monday night football game. So the whole off season, I've been preaching about how Brandon Sealy wants to run this too high system. He wants to show the middle of the field to be open and he wants he wants this alignment, if you, can, if you look at my camera, rather than something like this, where he has one guy where he, he wants to run the opposite of Gus Bradley, pretty much. And that's exactly what he showed. He had the highest middle of the field uh, open rate of any team in the league in week one. I thought that was a very welcome sight. Um, and again, I mean, Brandon Saley has shown that uh, he's, he's a man of his word and he's just an, an amazing coach. And I thought he really had a good game yesterday. Um, if we go back, uh, let's let's go back to this. And this was something that I didn't expect to pop off, but Derwin James, highest PFF grade of any, or second highest PFF grade of any safety, only behind Logan Ryan, who's technically like a, a slot cornerback safety hybrid. So I guess in terms of pure safeties, Derwin had the best um, uh, PFF uh, grade he had the highest pff coverage grade of any safety <sighs> i remember predicting that this guy was going to have a monster year back in like in april and may and i said brandon Sealy is the perfect coach for him he's going to put him in positions to succeed and derwin succeeded uh it's only one game you know we don't know how it's going to play out but you know he looked good he looked real real good so happy for him if we uh quickly um jump over to the defense defensive side of the ball. Um, the Chargers had the 12th best defense per EPA per play allowed. You know, not, you know, not, uh, not amazing. Uh, oh, wait, this is actually only looking at their downs. Let me fix that real quick. So if we, okay, so in terms of defense on every down, the Chargers had the ninth best defense per EPA per play. So, you know, not that bad. They weren't really going against that tough of an offense in my opinion no, no Curtis Samuel and Fitzpatrick got hurt um in terms of stopping the pass the the Chargers ranked 13th and in terms of stopping the run the Chargers ranked eighth now I know we were getting gashed in the run game I, I will admit the interior defensive line outside of Christian Covington and Justin Jones did not look pretty but this number we are probably only ranked we are definitely only ranked eighth because of that Antonio Gibson fumble uh, which cost the Washington football team the game and so big shout out to Kaiser and Asante Samuel that really turned the game on its, on its heels and pretty much won us that game. Um, so this number, I would estimate we'd probably be like down here if it wasn't for that fumble cause caused, 
by Kaiser. But, you know, defense played pretty well. All right, let's jump to the Cowboys. I thought this graph was pretty indicative of what we're going to see uh, this Sunday. Dak Prescott is going to get the ball out very quick. And he's going to be throwing a lot of intermediate throws, a lot of a lot of slants, a lot of digs, a lot of curls. Amari Cooper and CD Lamb both looked pretty solid. Lamb had a couple drops in that Bucks team, but they are going to get the ball out quick because number one, Lyle Collins is out, so they don't have a right tackle. Michael Gallup is out, so they don't really have a third receiver, and we don't know what Zach Martin is going to look like because you know he's going to be coming off COVID, so his conditioning could be bad. But you know he is an all pro, so I wouldn't expect too much of a drop off if even if he does return or if he doesn't return then we'll probably see like Connor McGovern or something on right guard. So like I said, Doc Prescott's going to get the ball out very quick and he's going to throw the ball short of the yards of the stick, or he's going to, he's going to have a relatively low average depth of target. Um, I put this graph together after the, after the uh, Dallas Bucks team, you can see there is Kellen Moore is a very good offensive coordinator, in my opinion. And I think if Dallas has like a top five offense, he could easily see some head coaching buzz um, but he's going to mix up his play calls. Like he's not just going to throw. And this is, and if we go back to the other graph, like, like I said, he had like a, around like a seven average at the target, but his, it, it wasn't just, he was, I, I should take back what I said about only throwing slants and curls. Kellen Moore did a good job of mixing everything up. So he called slants and curls for Gallup, uh, for CD and for Amari at points in the game, but he also knew when to take his shots, like taking those deep corner shots uh, to Amari or throwing like a fade right over a cover two. Um, that was the first play of the game, right? Dak throwing to the left hash. It was that 20, uh, about like 23, 24 yard completion to Amari. So that's what he's, he's going to be calling. And he's going to mix in a bunch of play action, tight end screens. screens. I'm, I hope, uh, you know, if any of the Chargers employees are watching this, they ran tight end screens a little bit. So we could expect those, those to Dalton Schultz. And, you know, even just screens to Ezekiel Elliott and Tony, Tony Pollard. So, you know, Dallas is going to be running, you know, a good mix of, of covered uh, uh, play calls through the air, and they're going to put their receivers in a, in a position to, to be great. Um, so as a whole, you know, in terms of EPA, uh, Dak had the 15th best EPA. He, like I said, he played pretty well on, you know, for, for the offensive line he had and, you know, how good the Bucks defense is. Um, but, you know, not not amazing, I guess, per EPA. The defense really wasn't too impressive. Um, if we look at their EPA per play allowed, the rank 16th, which is honestly is, is better than most people would think. Um, but I think, you know, getting two picks on Brady kind of rose that just a little bit. But otherwise, like they weren't really able to stop Antonio Brown, uh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. And their offense as a whole, to wrap it up, um, we already talked about their passing offense, their rushing offense against the Bucks, uh, third worst in, in week one. So are they going to run the ball against us? Maybe. But and Brandon Staley is going to invite them to run. Remember, if we if I go back to the I'm not going to go back to the middle of the field graph, but the Chargers are going to have the middle of the field wide open and they're going to play a lot of light block light boxes, which is a staple of Staley's defense. So they're going to invite the Cowboys to run. It's just, you know, how effective will the run game be for the Cowboys and, you know, what will they be able to be able to do on top of that? And um, I'm going to add something that, you know, I think is, is super important. The Chargers had a 47.4 success rate. So success rate is any play that's defined as having a positive EPA. So this number was 23rd last year. So they had the 23rd highest success rate of any team in the league on offense. And this year it's 12th. And it was against one of the best defenses in the league. So now we're going from one of the best defenses in the league to the Cowboys who probably have like an average, but probably below average defense. So I'm going to start doing this for every, uh, for every game going forward. My prediction for this game, uh, I'm actually going to go with the Chargers here. I'm going to go um, 35, 33 Chargers. I do believe it'll be a shootout. And I think in the end, it's just going to be, Justin Herbert's O-line can protect him more. And, you know, the Cowboys are going to be missing Lyle Collins. So Joey Bosa is going to have a chance to go up against like Ty. I don't know how to say his last name, Ty and C next year or something. Um, so it should be a, a really fun game to watch in SoFi, prime time, national television, Chargers win it. And yeah, that's, that's my prediction. So that's going to wrap it up. This was a very long video. So if you made it to the end, I appreciate it. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed me diving into the stats. 
um, make sure to leave a like. And with that, as always, bolts up. I'm Andre Knott, and on my new podcast, Brownstown, I'm chronicling the sometimes sad but always hilarious story of the last 20 years of Cleveland Browns dysfunction. With the voices of Jim Donovan, Brady Quinn, Tim Couch, Romeo Cornell, Josh Cribbs, TJ Ward, Phil Savage, and many more, we'll track how unbelievably bad decisions and bad luck kept this team down for way too long. So join us as we go tailgating in the Muni lot and diving deep into the dog pound. You're going to Brownstown.